So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Math 122. Today we're going to be talking about a new chapter, um, which is great because now that we're a month in our into our calculus course, it's time to start learning calculus. Um, which we're going to start moving in the direction of calculus at least today. Um, so that's what is going to be on the docket for today's class. Uh, we also have a couple of homework assignments upcoming. 1.8 is due February 13th. I think that's Monday. And then 2.1 will be due on Wednesday. Okay, so those will be like the homeworks that will be on the quiz for next week. But you also have a quiz today, which is over the homeworks 1.6 and 1.7. Um, so we'll do that at the last bit of class. So let me set the alarm like I usually do. I don't forget. OK, uh, office hours, math tutoring center, SI, same as always. Uh, are there any uh, administrative questions? comments or concerns before we start in on content for today? Do we do, like, at some point, if there is free time, can we do like, a quick little review of like, the half-lives and stuff? Of half-lives? Sure. Why don't we do that now? <clears throat> Okay, so the request was for a quick review of how to figure out what is the half-life or what is the doubling time of a quantity which is growing or decaying uh, exponentially. Okay, and the first thing to remember is, of course, we always want to use our exponential uh, function form which is either going to be p of t equals p naught a to the t or it will be p of t equals to e to the kt okay e to the kt so usually in a half-life problem or a doubling time they will tell you the rate okay they will tell you the rate at which something is uh, growing or decaying and your job is to find out what is the time it will take for that quantity to grow to double what it, we started with or half of what you started with if you're <coughs> decaying. Okay, um, so let's see how that would work. So I'm going to do two examples really quickly. Two examples. Find the doubling time of an investment. which earns uh, tw 25% uh, interest, and we're going to do it two ways, annually and continuously. Let's start with annually. Well, if I'm doing the annual uh, interest, then I should use the uh, the function form should be p of t equals to p naught times a to the t. And let me ask you all a question. Uh, since 25% is my interest rate, does that tell me that a is 0 0.25? No. What does it tell me? Yeah? A is 1.25. Specifically, it tells you that R is 0 0.25, and therefore A, what's the relationship between A and R? A is 1 plus R, which in this case is 1 plus 0.25, which is 1.25. Okay, but what's weird about this is that they don't tell us how much money we invested, okay? They don't tell us how much money we invested. They just want to know how long it's going to take to double. And that's because it doesn't matter whether you invest $1,000 or a $1 million. The time it's going to take for your money to double is going to be the same. Okay, so you can address this using one of two methods. The first method is to say, I'm just going to leave P0 as P0. Okay, whatever it is is what it is. And then you're going to see why it's going to cancel later. The second method is to say, if you feel better doing it this way, you can just choose an amount of money which you can invest, say 
I'm gonna put $100 in the bank and I'm gonna see how long it takes for it to become 200, okay? Uh, I'm gonna do it in general here. So what do we want? We wanna know what is the T1 half such that P of T1 half, well, what would I get? I would plug it in, I get P naught times 1.25 to the T1 half is equal to what? Well, sorry, not half, sorry, this should be T2. I use T2 for doubling time and T1 half for half life. Okay, and if we plug in this amount of time, our investment should have grown to twice what we started with, which is nice and neatly represented by the quantity two times P naught, okay? Or if you want, you can say, I'm gonna invest $100 and at the end I wanna have $200, okay, fine. If you wanna do it that way, that's also fine. Okay, but I'm gonna leave it in general forms because you can see that we're actually gonna cancel, right? Okay, 100 would cancel with 200 in the same exact way as does P naught and 2P naught. Okay, so now we have 1.25 to the T2 is equal to two. Apply the natural log to both sides. Oops. And then the T2 comes out. Sorry, ln of two. The T2 comes out. And then uh, we have ln of two on this side still. And now this is just, look, this is just has the following form. No one in this class, I think, would be confused if I gave you the equation t times three equals six. What would you do for this to solve for t? You would divide by three, right? Okay, but what I'm trying to say is that this equation is the exact same form, by which I mean it's the thing we want times a number equals another number. We solve it in the exact same way by dividing both sides by whatever's being multiplied. So you get T2 equals LN2 over LN of 1.25, okay? So that's the annual version. Let me show you the continuous version. For the continuous version, we do uh, P naught E to the 0.25 T, okay? So the, the rate 0 0.25 becomes uh, this k value in our formula. And now we want to know, well, again, what is T2 such that if you plug it in here, you get twice what I started with. So again, same process, cancel, cancel, log on both sides, you get 0.25 T2 equals ln of two. So T2 equals LN of two over 0.25. Okay, so that's a quick refresher on half-life and doubling time. Okay, for half-life, the only difference is we're gonna wait until we have one half times P naught instead of two times P naught. Yeah, Kellen. Can I ask you a question on number nine on the homework about half-lives? Sure. It said that a substance was decreasing by 6% 11 hours on the half-life of it. How do you solve for that? Sure, okay. Um, so, okay. So, substance decays by 6% in 11 hours. Find the half life. Okay, well, we know that the substance is decaying, so we're gonna use P of T equals two. Uh, P naught, and we can use E to the KT, or we could use A to the T. Which one do y'all like better? Who likes A to the T better? Who likes E to the KT better? Okay, more people like that, so we'll do that. E to the KT. Okay, great, so we know we have this function and we know something about it, right? It decays by 6% in 11 hours, okay? Which is to say that, look, P of 11 is what I get when I do P naught times E to the KT, where T is 11. And how much do I have left? If I have 6% less, 
I have how much times P naught? 0.94 times P naught. Okay? That's how much I have left after 11 hours. And now what can you do? You can cancel P naught. So again, it doesn't matter how much we started with. And what is this going to help us figure out? This equation, what's the only unknown? It's k, right? So then I can figure out what k is going to be. So 11k is equal to ln of 0.94. So therefore, k is equal to ln of 0.94 over 11, right? And then what do I want to do? Then what I want to do is find t1 half such that p naught times e to the ln of 0.94 over 11 times t2 is equal to p naught divided by 2. You see what I mean there? OK, so it's a two-part problem. First off, they don't tell you exactly what is the decay rate. They tell you how much you decay over 11 years instead of, or 11 hours or instead of over one hour, right? So we got to figure out how much we decay, what is our decay rate, k, first. Then once we have that piece of the puzzle, we just substitute our k in here. And now we want to find, oh, sorry, I put t2 instead of t1 half t1 half. We want to find the time t such that if you plug it in to this equation, again, it doesn't matter what p naught is because it's going to cancel, such that I have half of what I started with at the end. Right? Half of what I started with at the end. Okay? And then this equation is solved in the exact same way that we solved the last few problems. Okay. If you want to see it, maybe stay after class or we can talk about it in office hours sometime. Any questions on that? Okay. We're going to move on then to something new today. So, uh, I, I want to quickly motivate this and we're going to do a little bit of group work today. So, uh, what is the motivation? The motivation is that uh, in calculus, people often call calculus the study of change, right? Specifically, we want to look at rates of change, okay, and accumulated change. So we're about to start in on a long section which is going to talk about rates of change, uh, which essentially tells you, well, how fast am I rising Okay, how fast am I rising as I move to the side? So we have a nice way of describing that in terms of lines, right? The slope of a line tells you how fast you are going up or down, right? The slope of a line. But what about when we have a curvy function? Well, we still want to be able to describe how fast we are rising. It's just that how fast we're rising is going to depend on what part of the function we're at, right? So let's take a trip on... Uh, on this function, okay, which describes maybe distance from home versus time, okay? So what does it tell us? It tells us we start at home and initially we're going away from home quite fast, right? But what does it mean for this curve to be like flattening out like this? It means in terms of my physical problem, it means that I'm slowing down, right? I'm slowing down and then I stop, right? And then I put the car in reverse, right? And then I'm going back home, right? I'm going back home, I'm going home. And then I stop again and I start driving forward again and going back away from home, right? That's the story that this graph tells. But if I wanted to know, say, how fast was I driving at time t2? Then I want to say something about, well, how steep is this curve right here, right? And we don't yet have the tools to uh, say that yet. What we do have is the tools to say how fast was I going on average between t1 and say some later time t2. 
because what we do for that is we just take these two points, we connect them by a line, and this tell you can find the slope of this line because it's a line, right? So that was average rate of change, what we did before. But how then am I going to figure out what is my steepness at this point? Well, you can sort of express that steepness as we're going to see, it's going to be the same steepness as this line which goes like this, right? Which we call the tangent line, okay? We call this the tangent line. So this is kind of where we're going. And we wanna see how we can adapt the techniques which we know how to use for finding the slope of this line to see how we are going to find the slope of this line. Okay, so that is how we're going to, uh, or that's what we're going to talk about today, sort of heuristically. Are there any questions about like, just like the basic premise of what we're trying to do here? We're trying to quantify how steep a given section of the curve is. Okay, it doesn't seem like there are any questions, so let's get down to uh, specifics. Okay, so let's warm up by reminding ourselves what is the average rate of change, okay, between t equals a and t equals b for a function, right? Well, I've, I've drawn the basic picture up here for t1 to t2 of what we're going to do. It's gonna be the slope of that line, which is gonna be given by the change in height between the two points divided by the change in width between the two points, which is neatly expressed by f of b minus f of a, that's the change in height, divided by b minus a, okay? So we already covered that in the last chapter, but let's see how it actually works. So we'll, we'll do x cubed between two and three. Well, this is gonna be my b is gonna be three, and my a is gonna be two, and now I just need to plug in to the formula. So f of b, that's f of three, minus f of two, all over three minus two, which if I cube three, I get 27. If I cube two, I get eight. And on the bottom, what do I get? Um, just one, right? And then we subtract these things, and I believe we get 19 as our answer. Okay, so what does this describe? This describes the following picture. So what does x cubed look like? It looks something like this, okay? And if you take two here and three here, then we take the points here and here, we connect them by a line, and we find the slope of that line is 19. Okay, that's the basic picture of what's happening here. And it looks like, I mean, 19 kind of describes the slope of what's going on with the function between two and three fairly well. But what if we wanted to know, like, what is the actual slope at a given point here? That's what we're gonna try to figure out. Or what if we wanted to know what is the slope at two? It's slightly less than 19, right? It's slightly less than 19. Okay, so that's where we're going with this. Are there any questions about just finding average rate of change? Okay. Well, uh, you know, one sort of naive approach to this problem would be to say, well, okay, what if I do want to find the slope of this cubic function at exactly x equals two. So not over the period from two to three, but actually at this point here. What if I wanted to know the slope there? Well, you might think, why don't I just use the average rate of change, right? And I'll just take the endpoints to both be two, right? What if I take both of the endpoints to be two, right? Instead of finding the slope between this line and this line, I'm gonna br bring this point all the way down here and then try to find the slope of this line here, right? So let's try and see what happens if I do that. So I'm just gonna plug in f of two minus f of two divided by two minus two. And you can already see what's gonna be the problem here, right? We get eight minus eight over two minus two, which would be zero over zero. and we can't do zero over zero. We can't do anything over zero, right? So this is actually undefined. 
okay, undefined. So this is sort of <coughs> presenting us with a challenge, okay? Sort of presenting us with a challenge, but we still want to be able to quantify what that slope is because we can see like there is a given steepness at two, right? There is a given steepness there. We want to know what that steepness is. So what are we going to do? Well, let's, we're going to form into groups and we're going to see if we can draw our own conclusions from the following exercise. Okay, so uh, I'd like you to all get into your groups. We're going to work on problems three, four, and five. And at the end, what I'd like is for your group to come up with a mechanism by which you are going to tell me what is the slope of f of x equals x cubed at x equals to 2, okay? And hopefully the exercise will give you a good hint. All right, so I'll be coming around to help as you go along. Just raise your hand if you want some individual attention or if you have a question. No cheating if you've learned calculus before. <laughs> no, no, no. My, no, my brain is that right? Like, is that like what you do? I can't remember. No, my brain's not functioning. I'm going to spend a good little minute since I did this. <laughs> yeah, eventually you're going to use a power rule type okay. of thing like that. Yes. <laughs> But you have to learn the painful way so that you come to appreciate Ooh. how nice it is when we learn easier methods. No, the silver spoon is what I like to be fed from. <laughs> I 
I I remember doing tangent lines, but I remember being so god awful at them that I couldn't try to read it in my memory. I think I remember like doing I like the hoodies. Are you a Bills fan? No. I'm from New York. I'm from New York. Oh, we're just here in Rochester. So, yeah, I guess it's like close to Buffalo. Well, I'm not going to cheer for the Giants. They play in New Jersey, though. Yeah. It's kind of New York team. Yeah. If I grew up liking anything about the Bills, I would have been shy of it. Actually, dude. There's the mafia, baby. No, it's literally like an actual call fan. I don't even know how to go back. Well, yeah, I was going to say, you're on five. <laughs> I just, I knew the end. So, what do you notice? Do you notice a pattern in these results? I feel like I'm learning how to work on this and do from three. But I don't want to because it's easy. But my brain is running it with negative speed. I'm pretty sure I'm going to convince my one year old cousin to run faster than my brain. <laughs> I don't have my calculator with me, I just need to install the graph calculator app. I'm going to be able to see this just two ways. Um, it's all angry. So, zero, 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 or something like that. So, what do you notice? You go 19, 12.61, 12.061, 12.0061. What is this number close to? We're going very, very close to 12, right? Like, imagine if you repeated this process more, what are you doing? You're adding like lower zeros here. Like, it's kind of what you're doing, right? So that number is getting really, really close to 12, right? So you might expect that if you were to do this process over and over again, what's going to happen? This point is getting closer and closer and closer and closer here, and you're drawing like. Don't make me pull the unit circle. Like Surprisingly this. enough, I remember like everything. Like and you this point down. <laughs> no, it's just like so easy. No, like I remember when I took algebra two, I like hated it, and then like for some reason when I was in pre I was in there, and I was like, damn. It's mad easy. Because I like, I don't know, I, like the teacher just explained it to me different. And I was like, oh my god. And then I was like, and you like, yeah. I was like, damn, if you think about it, 180 degrees divided by 2 is 9 seconds. That's exactly what it is. But I'm still terrible. So we should get it. I think the That's why when I had to start getting triggered, I managed to do that. I was actually ready to show myself. I like to say that I hated it, but I also finished with like a ridiculously high score. Yeah. Well, because at my school, we didn't have AP physics, we had some Paul Gemini physics for like the Sumi schools in New York. You get extra credits from Sumi schools. So it was like AP physics with a little bit of extra New York bullshit. And I finished with 108 to get extra credit. Mainly because we didn't take our like final final and make huge regions of the things. But like, yeah, um, I finished with like 100 days. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's okay. how it is. But what about the like, I suck at math. I mean, do you know there's a pattern in these numbers? But my grade does not we reflect do. how much we suck at it. Is. We start with Just because photo math saved my ass multiple times at 3 a.m. does not mean we get like 12.06. Yeah, I took a. You notice that there's numbers 19 and 1.61. So, like, it was hybrid. We were going hybrid, so it was like half the days. So, like, I mean, well, at home exactly. doing my like, physics for like three hours. Words. Everybody in my class was morons. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> like, my one friend Keith, my teacher just got so fed up at the end of the year. We were like falsely in his class. He started giving Keith in a grade while untangling the stress of us during one of the stories. He literally started giving us a grade just for a thing. So you might have like to do it. I'm sitting here yeah. learning relativity if you have some action. I really like, I don't miss high school, but I miss the like, Tom Cole and Ben's 
Oh yeah, yeah, there was, there was, yeah, no, exactly. There was so much bullshit that happened in that physics class. Like, oh my god, oh my god. I'll, I'll never forget the first math lesson about relativity. I, I wish I had never learned relativity. Like, yeah, ruined my life, I right. swear to God. Well, like, we're sitting there, what we done? our teacher's trying to explain it to us, and Frank Keaton's like, he interjects, he's like, well, I have my fingers right here, and I can feel it. And Mr. Delvis like, how do you know those are your fingers? And we're all just sitting there, like, stunned. Because what do we even say to that? Like, how do you respond to that? What do you mean, how do you know these are my fingers? You're so specific, like, are these my fingers? I hate relativity, bro. This line. I'd actually yeah. rather, and then like, move the points even closer. Stick a toothpick under my face and like, make a brick wall with this relativity line. again. Right? You see what the pattern is here? If you're trying to ultimately know what is the slope of this line. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah, we take the, the slope on these average rate of changes over smaller and smaller intervals, and we look for a pattern in the numbers, and there is a pattern. It goes 19, 12.61, which is 12.06, 12.006 each time that we make the interval smaller. This number is getting closer and closer to 12. Yeah, how do we? Well, okay. It's just a method. It doesn't necessarily have to be a formula. Is it always available? No. I feel like that you never know. That's true. At least not the way we're doing right now. Yes, you're correct. Would anyone like a little more time to work? Do you have a specific question? What's the specific question? With problem five. Okay. Who else is struggling a little bit with problem five? <laughs> okay, lots of people. So, um, yeah, problem five is pretty tricky, but let's see if we can figure it out together. Okay, so um, what is the point of this? Well, let's take a look. We find the average rate of change between two and three. We already did that. We got 19, right? And then if we do part B, what do we get? We just do 2.1 cubed minus two cubed all over 2.1 minus 2, right? And if you multiply that out, what do you get? 12.6 or something like that? Ish. Okay, and if we do between 2 and 2.01, we just do the same thing, right? 2.01 cubed minus 2 cubed all over 2.01 minus 2, right? And what do we get when we do that? Someone tell me. 12.06. And how about for D? 12.006. Okay. So hopefully we mostly observed this type of uh, behavior going on here. And in fact, if you were to take this further, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we start with 19, and then we've got 12.6, 12.06, 12.006. If I want the next step, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, 12.0006, okay, and so on and so forth. So what do we notice? We notice as even though when we try to plug in 2 and 2, we get 0 over 0, what we can do is we can take B and let B become very close to 2, but not 2. Very close to 2, but not 2. And we can take the average rate of change over these incredibly small intervals, and we can look for a pattern which emerges, okay? A pattern which emerges, which based on this, okay, if I was to say, well, I have a sequence of numbers which are approaching something, what does it seem like we're approaching over time if we make our interval extremely small? Well, Looks like we're going to 12. Okay, good. So that's part four. It's 12. So now the hardest part is part five. Okay, I'm not looking for a formula here. What we're looking for is just a general method. Okay, a method is like a set of instructions, okay, which we could use to find the slope of a function at a given point. Okay, the process is defined as follows. We take the average rate of change over smaller 
and smaller intervals and search for a pattern in the results. And let me draw you a picture that will convince you why this is true. Why this makes sense. Okay, so imagine that I have a curve which looks something like this. Okay, I have a curve which looks something like this. Okay, and I want to know what is the slope at this point, okay, which we've already sort of said is going to be characterized by the slope of this line which comes in and just barely kisses our function at that one point. So I want to know what is the slope here, okay? If you want to think about it another way, you could say, look, imagine I'm riding a roller coaster. What do I want to know? I want to know which direction am I facing in? Am I facing up? Or am I facing down? What's my pitch? Okay, my angle of attack, I guess. All right? So, what do we do? The first thing we do is we find the slope of this line, which looks like this. And we feel proud of ourselves because the slope of the pink line is pretty close to the slope of the blue line. But we could do better. And here's how. If you were to take our average rate of change between A and B1 and move B1 closer to A. Let's take another one, B2 maybe. Let me do it with a different color. What color should we use? Yellow. I don't think the yellow is going to show up very well. How about orange? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> B2. OK, now let's find the average rate of change, which is going to be the slope of this line. And what do you notice? Which one is closer? The orange one, right? The orange line is, is, has a slope which is more similar to the blue line. Yes? And then we can repeat this process. We can take B... F I'm running out of colors here. Why don't we do brown? We could take B3 to be another number which is even closer to A. And then we're going to get another line whose slope is even closer to the slope of the blue line. So I can ask myself, what is the slope of this line? What is the slope of this line? What is the slope of this line? And then I can line them all up of these slopes, M1, M2, M3. And I can imagine what is going to happen after a long time. Okay, and for our problem, the numbers went something like 19, 12.6, 12.06, 12.006. And now we want to understand where is this going. Okay, we want to understand where this is going. Okay, so this is formally how we describe the rate of change at a point is through this process which we call a limit which don't worry if you've seen limits before we're not going to really talk about limits in this class but we have basically just described what a limit is we are going to allow this b to march closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to a until we're basically right on top of it and then we're going to get a very good approximation of the slope of the blue line okay are there questions about the like heuristic process here okay then let's see a definition or two all right so we call this okay or the result of this methodology we call it instantaneous rate of change okay instantaneous as opposed to average average is over a given time interval when you shrink a time interval to a single point then you're talking about an instant in time right shrink a time interval as small as humanly possible you're talking about an instant. So the instantaneous rate of change F at A, okay, 
can also be called the rate of change of f at a. Okay, And what is it? It's defined to be the average rate of change of f as the interval around a gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, whatever that number may be. Okay, whatever that number may be. Sometimes it's a little hard to see what it is, but it does exist. There is a number which will be at the end of that process. Okay, so we just estimated the instantaneous rate of change of f at a by this process in the previous example. We guessed that the actual slope at 2 was 12. That was our guess based on this process. Okay, so let's do one more example of, of that, okay, which I'll do, we'll, or we'll do it together. Okay, the quantity in milligrams of a drug in the blood at time t, I'm definitely going to need my calculator for this, so let me get it out. At time t is given by this function, which looks like exponential decay, right? So we want to use the rule that we wrote down in problem 5 to estimate the rate of change of this quantity at t equals to 3. So what are we trying to do? We have, let's draw a quick picture to see what we're doing here. We have an exponential decay, which starts at 25. So I'll start it off at 25, and I'll draw a picture which looks kind of like this. OK, kind of like that. And what do we do? We want to know, look, when t is equal to 3, we want to know how quickly is this drug leaving the bloodstream, which is to say I want to know what is the slope of this tangent line. So what am I going to do? I'm going to use average rate of change over smaller and smaller intervals. Okay, So I'm going to take the following. Average rate of change over the interval. The first one, maybe we could do 3, 4. And then maybe we'll do 3, 3.1. And then 3, 3.01. Okay, that's what we'll do. So I do g of 4, which is 25 times 0 0.8 to the fourth. And I subtract 25 times 0 0.8 cubed. And I divide that by 1, right, by 1. So OK, 25 times, I'm going to do parentheses, 0.8 to the fourth minus 0.8 cubed. OK, and I'm getting minus 0.256. Do we agree? Anyone who's calculating on their own? Yeah. Yeah? OK, so that's what we get when we plug in. OK, and then we're going to do it over the smaller interval. So I'm going to replace 4 now by 3.1. OK. And then I have to divide by, so you, you, you imagine what's going to happen here. 3.1 minus g of 3. We divide by 0 0.1. And I'm getting minus 0 0.28. No, not point. Yeah, minus I'm sorry, what's happening? 2.56 2. Yeah. is what that should have been. Sorry. Minus 2.56. And this one should be minus 2.8. Minus 2.824-ish. And then we're going to just keep doing this process, plugging in closer and closer numbers and dividing by smaller and smaller ones. So I'll make that a 0 0.01. And now what am I getting? I'm getting something like negative 2.853 dot dot dot. OK, so what am I noticing? What I'm really doing here is for this first thing, I'm checking what is the slope of this red line, which looks like so. Yeah, And then for the second one, I'm taking something very close by, like 3.01, or 
or 3.1, right? And I'm checking, what is the slope of this line, which is like even closer, okay? And these lines, it's a little bit hard to see in the drawing, their slope is approaching the true slope that we want to know, okay? So I would say my approximation here is I would say that the instantaneous rate of change at t equals to 3 is approximately minus 2.85 <coughs> approximately minus 2.85 uh, milligrams per minute. Okay? So, during the third, or at the three minute mark, okay, at the three minute mark, the drug is leaving the body at this rate, or this speed. Okay? All right, so any questions on that process? Yeah, Jake. Ah, yes. Uh, everyone wants to ask this question. Why can I not just go ahead and skip to the very end? Um, well, I would say there is such a thing as this process failing, okay? Uh, which we won't talk about for a little while. Uh, but the reason that I do it three times instead of just once at 3.01 is what I'm really looking for isn't just what are the numbers, but what I'm looking for is the gradual, uh, the gradualness of this number getting close to a target number. So what I really want to see between each of these is that, look, the difference between this and this is not that big. And then when we take the process even further, the difference between these two numbers is even smaller. So what I want to see is that this difference, as I make my accuracy higher, okay, these numbers are changing less and less. If I took this even more, okay, I'd start seeing things like negative 2.85, and you start to see like some of them get kind of locked in. You see what I mean? Or something like that. Okay, and so what I'm looking for is consistency between like these first couple of digits, okay? and making sure that nothing really radical is going on. If I went from negative two to like, to like negative 50 in one step, okay, then that would tell me I need to make this interval much smaller because I haven't yet sort of burned out my entire process. Is that clear? Yeah. So that's why I do it multiple times. I'm looking not just at the numbers, but at the difference between these numbers as I'm looking for the pattern of what it's getting close to. Okay? That's a great question. Yeah? How do you know to stop at 0.001 and not go farther to get that speed? Yeah, how do you know how to stop at 0.001? Well, I mean, it just comes down to your need for accuracy, right? If the problem tells you to estimate to like the nearest integer, okay, then you could probably stop after the first two and say, well, it's kind of close to three, right? Um, but in practice, you know, it depends on what level of accuracy you need for your implementation, you know? Yeah? I may be wrong, but like, as you go to three, like a smaller number, wouldn't the negative get bigger? Instead of 2.85, wouldn't it be like... Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, yes. Yeah, it should, it should, it should the, to, in order for the pattern to, no, yeah, yeah, eight, five, like four, three, or whatever, that's okay. bigger than this. Eight, five, okay. four, because yeah. the four is bigger than the three. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It should, con it's probably going to continue in that sort of upward or downward trajectory. Yes. Right yeah, no, you're good. So, more questions on this one? Um, there is a actual like very rigorous understanding of this process which you can use to find an exact number but we don't teach it in this class because it's a little bit theory heavy um, and 
in my experience, many business students don't care as much about the theory. They want to know how to use it, right? So that's what we teach in this class. We teach you how to do this and how to use the results in order to understand something in terms of applications, okay? So that's why we don't go through this theory. But if you ever want a lesson on theory, believe me, I can give it to you in office hours. I'll give you more than you could have ever hoped for. Okay, so uh, any more questions on this before we move on? Okay, so uh, let's talk about the derivative. Oh my God, the derivative. We're, we finally met calculus. Okay, so what is the derivative? Well, the derivative is just the word that we give for the instantaneous rate of change, okay? So we just have defined how to find the instantaneous rate of change. In other words, we've learned how to find the derivative of a function at a point. Okay, so here's some notation, okay? We use this symbol here, f prime of a, okay, is how you say it, f prime of a, okay? That's how you would read that out loud. And what it means is the instantaneous rate of change of f of x at x equals to a, okay, at x equals to a. Oh, I guess that's written right down here, isn't it? Okay. So yes, that's what we mean when we write that. So uh, in the last problem, what did we do? We found out what is g prime of three, we said is approximately negative 2.85 milligrams per minute, per minute, okay? So the slope of the function depends on the location which we are looking at, right? If I'm riding on a roller coaster, there's some times where I'm going up and sometimes where I'm going down or whatever. And if I wanna understand what is my uh, pitch, I need to specify what time, okay? Well, yes, I was riding on the roller coaster for two minutes. Sometimes I was looking up, sometimes I was looking down. If you want me to answer which way was I looking, you have to provide me with the exact second of my roller coaster ride, right? Then I can tell you at that second I was looking up or down or whatever, right? Okay, so this is what the derivative is, and it basically just quantifies how fast uh, this function is changing at a given point, okay? So the terminology, once again, is instantaneous rate of change of f at t equals a, or sometimes we say it's the slope of f at t equals a, or we say f prime of a, or you could even say the slope of the tangent line to f of x at x equals to a. That's another way you could say it, okay? Okay, so let's have some practice with this, uh, with this concept, okay, in the following. All right, so uh, we are gonna use our brains to graph the function f of x equals x squared, okay? What kind of shape does that function make? Parabola. It's a parabola. And by the way, what kind of function is this? Remember in 1.9, we learned all those different types of functions? It is a polynomial, but there's an even more specific, there's an even more specific word we had for functions like this. Quadratic, that's the one. It's polynomial and quadratic. And I want to quickly highlight the difference between a quadratic and a polynomial and uh, these functions which we call exponentials because exponential you feel like, oh, well, there's an exponent. Isn't it exponential? What's the difference between a polynomial and an exponential? Can someone highlight that for me? Yeah, in the exponent. So the variable here is on the downstairs floor, the main floor. For an exponential function, we're looking at something more like two to the x, where the variable is in the exponent, okay? That's an exponential function. A polynomial, quadratic, well, a polynomial is just any sum of, um, of power functions with positive integer powers. Okay, 
So that's what we have here. We have a polynomial that makes a parabola, and it looks something like, a little something like this, okay? A little something like that. And here's like one, and here's two, whatever. Negative one, negative two, and obviously zero is in the middle. Okay, so we have a polynomial function. Uh, it's a quadratic. Its graph is a parabola. And what do we want to do? We're supposed to determine whether the following quantities are positive, negative, or zero. Okay, not too bad. Let's start with f prime of one. Well, f prime of one describes the slope of the function at this point, which we could draw the tangent line to see what it looks like. It looks something like this, right? And if we want to say whether f prime of one is positive or negative, that's the same as asking, well, is the slope of this blue line positive or negative? And what do we think? It's positive, right? Because it's going up. Okay, so f prime of one is positive. How about f prime of negative one? That's this line here. Looks negative to me. Okay, two, I think again it's positive. What about f prime of zero? I think it looks more or less like so. What kind of slope does a horizontal line have? Zero, zero. good. So this one's equal to zero. F prime of negative two, I'd say, is probably less than zero. Okay, so we're, we're starting to look at the sign of the derivative at, at various different points. And now let's compare. Okay, let's compare. Which is larger between F prime of one and F prime of two? Well, let's take a look. We're asking about the slope of the blue line versus the slope of the green line. And what do we notice about the slope of these two lines? Which one's bigger? Yeah, the green line. So what is this really asking us? Which is larger, f prime of one or f prime of two? It's quantifying between this point and this point. Where is the function steeper? Okay, where is the function steeper? And it's the second point, right? f prime of two is larger, larger than f prime of one. Okay, so this is just a question about the steepness. Okay, so really quickly, I'll mention, sorry. <laughs> I heard a, <laughs> a no, don't move on. Okay, I won't move on. <laughs> we good? All right, so really quickly, I'll just mention uh, briefly that look, what is instantaneous velocity? Velocity is the rate of change of the distance function. In other words, instantaneous velocity is the instantaneous rate of change of d of t, which is d prime of t, okay? The derivative of the distance function gives us the instantaneous velocity. All right, we'll close there for today and we'll do the quiz. So everybody, please put everything away. And I'll hand out the quiz.